Guilty Gear Strive might literally need no introduction, not only because I'm so late to the party that they've managed to get their first DLC character out, but also because it somehow even managed to pull a Tekken and convince some of the more socially capable people on the planet to give it a shot as well. This game has been all over my Twitter feed for the last two months in its release, and for good reason. It's a new chapter in the Guilty Gear franchise, a series that diehards keep so near and dear to them that they're willing to pretend for three hours that the lore is good and might be the only fighting game that people have been excited for in the last three years. It's developed by Arc System works, beloved creators of family mini golf, super dodgeball brawlers, and some fighting games I guess. It also features rollback netcode, a networking type that fighting games use to make the longest distance connections at least playable, which is unfortunately seldom seen in a lot of the major releases of the genre. It seemed to actively want to remold a lot of the systems that kept the learning wall for the game high and dig its way out of the typical anime fighter difficulty curve that's plagued the series previously, which seemed to instill some of the incels of the fanbase with fury but had a lot of the newcomers to the franchise franchise exclaiming, finally, an anime fighter that's socially acceptable to say that I know how to play, but not socially acceptable enough to justify having all the female characters in my search history. The previous entry in the series might be my favourite fighting game of all time, and though it was about as incomprehensible as an eldritch nightmare, once you got to know it, it was a fast-paced title that had depth in spades, with a highly flexible set of universal mechanics to make any character feel like your own, but still a clear vision of being aggressively focused. As you might be able to tell, I was pretty damn excited for Strive but a hundred hours later between both the PlayStation and the PC release, I've only come to grow more fond of the older titles in the series. I certainly wouldn't say that I hate it, like I've said many times after a salty L, but personally, I don't think that there's a lot that stands out here to enjoy as someone who's already played a lot of fighting games. I want to re-emphasize personally, since I see a lot of people enjoying it so much that you could assume that their download included their first and likely only sexual experience. But much like my first sexual experience, I don't see what all the hype is about. This leaves me in a bit of a dilemma. With the videos that I've made here, I've gotten quite a lot of people into Guilty Gear, and many of them might have started playing fighting games with Strive specifically. So I want to make this clear. If you like Strive, please do not let this video undermine how much you enjoy the title or feel like you're in the wrong for enjoying it. I'm glad that so many people are having a quality time here, especially with the newer generation of fighting game players. There seems to be people competing for who has the least interesting personality by shitting on people that like Strive, or actively want it to do poorly. So if any of these goblins are coming at you for enjoying a video game, you can tell them that I said go fuck yourself, and I've got more internet points than them so you know that I'm the higher authority here. Even so, I've got very little good to say about Strive, so if sitting through 70 fucking minutes this is gonna take so long to edit minutes of someone's copium that it isn't Guilty Gear XR Rev 3 doesn't sound like your kind of good time, I'll live up to the title and keep it brief. Guilty Gear Strive is by no means a bad game, it's just a title that leaves a lot to be desired. The game can consistently feel restrictive due to the cancel system only allowing very specific moves to cancel into one another, and although every character is very unique and interesting on the surface, most come across as extremely isolated in their potential. The unique Roman cancel system is interesting and allows characters so rigid that you'd assume that they've got rigor mortis to develop the flexibility of an Olympic gymnast, but is tied to a boring meter that doesn't let you feel its benefits frequently enough. The air movement makes the game feel sticky and weighty, like like you're wading through tar to get to your opponent. None of this means that the game doesn't have depth like some people have claimed, but depth is a quality that's almost intrinsic to fighting games as a genre, and isn't anything to write home about unless you've been living your whole life as a checkers fanatic. While I understand that a lot of the mechanics do have their own value in how they influence the game and how it's played, playing hopscotch without legs also influences how it's played, but that doesn't change the fact that I'd rather play a game with more choices, interesting mechanics, and I want my legs back. As a result, Strive feels like a game that's most interesting quality is the novelty of a new fighting game, but after 10 hours novelty starts to turn into monotony. For some of you, that might be fine, you might not even be intending to put 10 hours in, but the experience that you're getting inside of that time isn't really strong enough to justify the game's enormously high £55 asking price. For the people that might be intending to play for longer than that, I think that the restrictive systems make for a game that shows glimpses of the freeform fighter that it could be, but never really delivers the goods, making the only time that the title is enjoyable is when you're winning, and personally, if I have to be winning in order to have a good time, then I'm not playing a very good game. Ultimately, Guilty Gear Strive is a disappointing game that could be fantastic with some tweaking. It's certainly not bad, maybe even 
good. Though it feels like there's a lot missing. Not because of a lack of content there, but more a lot of smaller problems that compound to annoy me as time goes on. While there are some interesting experiments going on here, and almost nothing is done egregiously bad, they never feel like parts that intertwine to create an interesting game, and ultimately feels underwhelming. And I know that the majority of my audience is American, meaning that you don't speak English, so let me give you a reminder. Underwhelming is not synonymous with a good time. If you're someone who needs a number to put somewhere on your spectrum of video games, here it is. 5 out of 10. Oh, I forgot. Numbers below 8 cause people to spontaneously combust, so let's put out that wildfire. A 5 for me is an average game. It's where I'd put Strive, Counter-Strike, Dragon Ball, and even Accent Core Plus R, but that's mostly due to control issues more than anything. This doesn't mean that it's bad, it just means that it's middle of the road. Even Rev 2 I wouldn't be able to give more than an 8 at most. And I don't think that I've ever played a fighting game that goes above that. A lot of this video will have me talking very negatively, and a part of that is because I was expecting so much more more from this title, but when I look at it without that preconceived expectation, I still find a game that doesn't do a lot for me. Apologies if parts of this video also get quite bland and only occasionally shows flares of personality, but I thought it would be the right thing to do, considering that the review should also be a reflection of the product that it's talking about. Oh shit, okay, uh, well we've still got a lot of the video to go, so let's get this video started proper, shall we? Or at least, we will, as soon as the game finally finishes communicating with the servers. I'm not willing to tank the viewer attention by starting on infrastructure problems, so while we wait for the game to load, we'll briefly talk about older games in the franchise. Strive is the Halo Reach of Guilty Gear. Halo Reach wasn't an inherently bad game, the fact that people are still playing it today is a clear testament to that, but it also wasn't the title that most fans of Halo 3 and 2 were looking for. It changed a lot about how the game worked, and while very clearly still a Halo game wasn't nearly familiar to the kinds of people that would make videos titled Halo is important. As a result, sometimes changes got confused with flaws for the people that didn't like it, and flaws got confused with changes for the people who were blindly in love with it. As a fan of the franchise, I'm not going to compare Strive to older Guilty Gears too much in the hopes of avoiding the same perspective dilemma, but a lot of what I like about fighting games just so happens to be in older titles without many other games that I've played replicating the points that I like. I think that Strive is underwhelming and follows trends that I don't like as a fighting game, not as a Guilty Gear. As such, even though I'm going to avoid comparison, I will point out where I think that the series has made the same stumbles before. If you see this asterisk on screen, it means that it's a problem that I can find in other Guilty Gear titles. If you see this one, it's a problem that I can find in other fighting games as a whole. A lot of what I value in the older titles is just how much variety you have on someone's block with the freedom of the cancel system, and how a lot of situations forced your opponent to make choices rather than reactions or they'll simply lose. On the defensive side, it certainly wasn't the Mona Lisa with a push block, but the small defensive options that you had made for a game where you were clawing for defensive advantages that would convert into stealing your opponent's turn from them. The meter was so good that I made a whole video about it, and a lot of that comes down to the varied values in the options of a shared resource, even if it wasn't well balanced. All of this can be said for both Plus R and the Exard series, but Plus R feels comparatively more clunky to Exard in movement and controlling your character, probably due to a lack of buffer. But once you get a feel for it, it can be as free-flowing as Exard. Strive theoretically has a lot of this stuff, but in the same way that I'd be your dad if I wore his skin. All of the components are still there, but how it walks and talks isn't remotely similar. The game should be ready soon, so let's also get one extra point out of the way. This video isn't an attempt to shit on the people at Arc System. I think that the people that worked on Strive should be proud of what they've made, especially in COVID times. Making games is hard as fuck. A product on this scale is probably much more difficult to make than many of us can imagine. And I don't want people to use this video as an opportunity to shit on the developers. This is a critique of the product, not a critique of the people that made it or the people that enjoy it. Fucking hell, finally, Arc System, get your shit together. How hard is it to load into a main menu? In Guilty Gear, two people go at each other until someone's life bar reaches zero. You know, like, 
in video games. The first thing that might strike you like a baseball bat made of whatever's keeping me so dense are the visuals, so gorgeous that I literally don't feel the need to bring it up for the rest of the video until they start to get in the way. If I was to talk about a game like Them's Fighting Herds where the visuals might have you running for your virgin be gone spray, I'd probably have something more to say about it. But saying the game looks fantastic is on the same level of interesting discussion as debating whether water is wet or if you're a degenerate. Once you finally get past the visual honeymoon phase and have commissioned your favourite artist for even more milia hentai, you'll start to have to think about the actual gameplay. At a longer distance, there's not a lot going on for a lot of the characters in this game, with the exception of Faust, the one that thinks that soccer is spelt football, and maybe Kai at a stretch. You'll mostly just be running around and contesting for space, not with projectiles but by positioning yourself in your character's ideal distance. It's more a game that focuses around the close and the mid-range. From this distance, you're going to be swinging at your opponent a lot and just about trying to edge out a hit on them if your character benefits from it, or trying to force a whiff or block from your opponent in a way that allows you to get much closer to them. You've got plenty of ways to close the distance with runs and air dashes that travel further and faster forward rather than backward, which makes for a title that doesn't have the dancing in and out of space element that you might expect from a game that's got fast movement options because you can get in quickly but get out slowly. Once you've gotten in, you're going to spend most of your time fishing for openings like a con artist trying to convince the elderly that their toaster has a virus and it can only be solved with Xbox gift cards. That is to say, you're either going to get in and ruin someone's life quickly, or you're going to be banging your head against a wall building up the potential damage bar until you ruin it even faster. Strife doesn't have a lot of the left-right low-high mix-up confusion of other weeaboo fighters. It's still occasionally present, but at most distances jump-ins are normally reactable, and most overheads often require some meter to capitalize on with the roman cancel system, with the exception of dust, but it's so slow that everyone's able to react to it like it's a YouTube trending video. Lows very rarely go from low to high back to low, so your opponent doesn't have to worry too much about being put in a position where they have to choose between blocking high or low. They're more frequently blocking low until they're blocking high, where the pressure situation ends, and even then it normally won't convert into moves that open up for big damage. So a lot of your time on block is spent trying to catch them attempting to leave your pressure, whether that be by them doing jump backwards, a button to take their turn, or spending meter to leave with YRC. If someone's turtling refusing to do anything, you can always go for a grab, which is hard to tech and quick to activate so most people will try to escape it with a jump back. On defense, faultless defense, just blocks and YRCs are designed to help you establish distance and create openings by manipulating the outcome of your opponent's pressure. There's some pretty distinct issues with this that we'll get into later, but for the most part just know that if you're put into a blocking situation you're mostly going to be looking for openings to break up their pressure with a button or holding up back. You can use back dashes as well, but they're a little bit tricky to use since you're not given a huge amount of iframes. It's certainly something that's usable, but trying to find applications for it mid-match normally bears fruit the same way that casinos create good financial choices. These make for a game that's pretty strongly focused around close range interactions, with a heavy emphasis on closing the distance between your opponent and you, and then putting them in rock paper turtle situations. Jump beats grabs, buttons beats pressure resets, turtling doesn't really beat anything but you put yourself at no risk, or should I say puts you at more risk. The more you block, the more this bar fills up at the top. It affects the amount of damage that you'll take upon the next combo. And if it maxes out, you'll get counter hit, which gives some slightly different properties to your opponent, allowing them to get a better follow up. You should also try to avoid being near the wall, for many reasons, one of the Strive unique ones being that the wall can break. If your opponent is the one that caused it to break by comboing you against it, not only do you take additional damage, but they gain positive bonus, which makes them gain meter passively over time, nearly doubles their meter gain, gives them a 10% additional damage bonus, makes them take 10% additional damage, and makes the opponent want to die, you'll want to exit existence even faster if they broke the wall with a super, because this gives them a hard knockdown as opposed to resetting you both to neutral. You've got a meter here which is used for faultless defense, roman cancels, and supers. Faultless defense being that push block from earlier, roman cancels being a move cancel that does a bit more than cancel your move depending on what color it decides to be, and you're on the channel about video games, I'm going to make a wild assumption and guess you know what a super is. There's also bursts, I don't really bring it up for the rest of the video, uh, they get you out of combos and it's on a separate meter, there's not really much else to say about it. This core is not a problem, I definitely would have preferred for greater mix-up opportunities, but if all of the systems that work into this particular game flow are fine, then it's not an issue. Most of your time spent will either be making a read on someone's block, or trying to hold ground that doesn't allow you to be put into a blocking situation. This wouldn't normally be my go-to type of fight 
fighting game. But I've been able to enjoy games like Third Strike that are further away from what I would normally like with resource bullshit and mix-up blenders, and instead focusing more on things like pressure resets and positioning like Strive. These games aren't mirrors of each other, and since we've had 20 years to finger ourselves every time we get an aggressive parry, Third Strike is no longer even similar to how it was designed to be played. But compared to what I'd normally enjoy, both of these games are more focused around elements of holding ground and sussing out if your opponent respects your unblock play. This makes Strive a decently enjoyable fighting game in short bursts, and even more so as a beginning fighting game, since you're able to engage with your opponent before noticing all of the smaller problems. The thing is, I don't think that Strive is necessarily designed to be a game that you play a little bit. It was probably considered, and maybe even designed to be more enjoyable in short bursts, but fighting games are generally considered to be ones that you play for hours, days, months, to years, to the point where there's an entire culture around a genre. However, over time you're going to notice more of the smaller issues that either limit your abilities or become an uncomfortable itch in game feel like a rusty knife from a London youth. Sometimes literally, depending on where the tournament's being held. The problem comes in that every single system that feeds into this cycle of taking space, putting someone into a block situation, winning or losing that scenario, and repeating until someone wins either feels unresponsive, doesn't allow for much diversity, or does allow for that diversity, but isn't accessible frequently enough. The best way that I can describe the experience of playing Strive is like a pizza from a really good store, but with toppings that clash or go against your taste buds. Sometimes them toppings can be alright by themselves, or if everything on the pizza is also there to complement it, they get even better. But you've given me pineapple with anchovies, it doesn't matter how much I love anchovies, pineapple tastes like shit and overpowers my salt fish. So let's go through the metaphorical toppings that I think work and don't and see how they affect the game, starting with probably the part that I care about the most. Movement is one of the most important things to me. Obligatory self-deprecating joke here. It doesn't matter what the genre is, platformers, fighters, first-person shooters of every kind, if it isn't fun to move around, I'm not going to care. It might be why games like Street Fighter didn't initially appeal to me. My fighting game journey started with Super Smash Bros. Melee, only to get excited and promptly ejected from any possibility of dopamine with 4, and then going on to Guilty Gear and moving on to Tekken, only to come back to Gear and then falling in love harder than ever. The binding point between all of them is that they work to make movement fun before the other person is even a factor. It's a key part of why I can't enjoy any of the versions of Street Fighter 2. Nothing about the movement is fun. Neither is anything else about the rest of the gameplay, but Capcom's hush money is making it so that I'm only allowed to critique their last piece of cultural relevance in small enough bursts that you won't realise it's dog shit. If the movement isn't engaging, you're going to grab my attention the same way that using a megaphone to shout at a deaf person is going to get the point across. While Strive doesn't stumble at every hurdle with its ability to get from point A to point B, it struggles a lot with making the air movement anything more than uncomfortable. Running is fine, something the Arc System didn't figure out in BB Tag, so I'm glad that they learned that it feels awful there, but converting your momentum from a run into the air is near inconsistent, with quotation marks the size of Mars. How much momentum you can serve from a jump changes from character to character. Characters like Giovanna have no problems converting momentum, whereas characters like Mei seem to drop momentum like a balloon from a cannon. The latter doesn't feel like a good way to move, in any game, and while I understand that movement is a good way of making a character feel unique, by doing it in this way they might have succeeded in making some characters more mobile than others, but they've made the characters that aren't able to convert velocity edge on reminiscent of underdeveloped. This is a minor problem in the movement, but when the other aerial option of air dashing also fluctuates in quality, I can't help but find the movement as comfortable as a jumper made of bricks. Actually that's partly a lie, if you want to go backwards with your air dash you're in luck, while you don't go very far, you do travel instantly and you're able to act equally as fast out of it. I could talk about how I don't like how it travels a distance so small that you can count the pixels moved on nine fingers, but since the whole movement system is built towards making travelling forwards significantly better than travelling backwards, I can understand why it's built this way, and they didn't sacrifice the control of your character in order to do it. However, if you want to go forward, you'll have to deal with what I'm assuming is a cruel joke put in place to smite down joy from those who find comfort in a quality air dash. I understand that what I'm about to say is pedantic, but 
I think I'd rather slowly bleed out in a bathtub than have to air dash in this game. The big problem being the startup. Unlike a back dash, forward dashes require you to push off of a disc in order to go forward. And so you have a couple of frames of startup before you actually start moving at your top speed, along with a couple of frames before you can input a move. It might not look too bad as a viewer of this video, the same way that you can't smell how bad your opponent's festering stench is, but every single time you go to air dash, it's as though you've had the connection drop to 14 frames of delay. It makes every single character that can air dash significantly less responsive than they actually are by making it as if you're penciling in actions for the game to do in a schedule, rather than asking the game to perform the action there and then. This also has some implications on how you use the air dash for offense specifically. In the corner you can use this for extending pressure, depending on the character, by air dashing instantly, though quite a lot of characters still feel quite sluggish when doing this. Air dashing in neutral becomes about as useful as a McDonald's in a diabetic ward, as now your movement becomes so telegraphed that it can be reacted to with consistency at mid-screen, making for an unadvisable movement option. It's not unusable, but air dashing in this title is more a solution to specific whiff scenarios rather than an intrinsically fun way of getting from point to point because of this delay. I understand that this is a minor point to many, but as someone that likes the movement element of fighting games the most, the awkward stutter before an air dash starts ends up taking centre stage of my thoughts on the game anytime I'm about to press forward forward. While I don't understand the way that the air dashes start, I can understand what they were going for with the portion where you're actually moving. Different characters Characters have different air dashes. Some of the weird kids decided to dye their hair and have alternative air dashes, but for the most part, the differences come in length. Characters like Zato don't actually have an air dash, but when they dash, they instead get put into a flight state, whereas Milia has two air dashes that are quite small. This allows different characters to utilize their air dash in different ways. I think that Milia is probably the most standout example of this since it works into a left right mix up game off of a disc, which is a core part of a character. The part that I take umbrage with the most is how momentum is retained off of an air dash. Firstly, it decays extremely fast, and while some characters might travel further than others, they all have this balloon out of a cannon feeling. That is unless you put a button behind your dash, in which case they'll move with whatever speed they were already travelling with. This makes it so that regardless of what you're doing going forward, you'll almost always put a button behind it, because it's both the fastest way to travel, the furthest way to travel, and forces your opponent to either block or contest. I'm going to assume that this was to make it a choice between travelling far and fast versus short but safe, since you're able to block after after the startup of an air dash. But this causes air dashing to lack being a useful tool at both full screen and mid screen since it's both safer and faster to just run. The momentum doesn't stop air dashing from being a useful tool outright, but instead reinforces it in becoming a mix up tool rather than being both a mix up tool and a movement option. Aside from those two massive glaring tumors, I think that the ideas that they wanted to get across in the movement is fine. I debate that quite a lot of the characters base jump heights are a little bit too high, but I wouldn't really be able to give you a concrete reason why. I think it's because it forces the other player off screen, especially when you double jump and so it can make everything a little bit visually unclear and harder to pass than I feel like it should be. I'd like for some of the more defensively minded characters like Axel to have a faster run, but that's because I play the fucking character, of course I'd want them to be broken. The points that I hold a grudge against are purely how you experience your character moving from point A to point B. I'm not super keen on the way that it impacts gameplay, but it's not the problem itself. I'm all for creating systems that influence how the players interact with the opponent, but I think in the pursuit of making the players slam into each other, they've made for a movement system that's fun to think about, but not fun to interact with. And personally, if you're going to be doing that, you're going to be starting on the wrong foot. Not like I'm too keen to rush around too much anyway, because even when I'm up close and personal to someone, I find that the cancel structure that they've implemented, while not awful, makes for about as much variety in options as there is cultural variety in an English countryside pub with a sign outside proclaiming no Europeans allowed failing to acknowledge that the Europeans don't want to be around us either. Speaking of connections that we cancelled... The cancel system and combo system are somewhat interlinked in Strive. The main reason that you're going to be fishing for counter hits rather than a mix up specifically is because of the way that cancels have limit combo openers. Though they made for a cancel system that requires a whole diagram to understand, the system that looks confusing on paper actually comes across as decently natural when you're playing. It's got the inverse problem of air movement. It feels fine but impacts gameplay negatively because I'm indecisive and can't decide if I'm impartial to Strive emotionally or systemically. Generally speaking, you're not able to cancel or low like 2k into a close slash or a move that will launch the opponent. This makes you dependent on the hit stun to be a deciding factor on if something will connect. 
which generally speaking, normal hits don't make lows or highs able to link into a move that gets the combo gears going. That is unless you get a counter hit, at which point it's going to vary from character to character as to what will and won't combo. As a result, the choice between high or lows becomes a bit of a non-thought, it's more about thinking about how your opponent will pussy out the situation and picking your moves accordingly. That is unless you've got enough meter for a red roaming cancel, at which point better pick the right side of the coin dickhead or I'm slamming you right through that wall and taking half your life with me. Whether or not this is a good or bad thing to you is going to vary from person to person, wildly, but this leads to a game where you're spending a lot of your time waiting for someone to open themselves up rather than opening them up yourself, putting them in situations where they have to work off of assumption rather than reaction. I get that for many that might not sound like a bad idea and by reducing the cancel system you're actually making for a more enjoyable game by putting someone inside of less variable dangerous situations. So perhaps I'm a masochist, but I want to be put in a scenario where I'm forced to guess if I've played poorly enough to let them get into a position where they're able to put me in a directional blender. Despite how they've changed the cancel system, and by proxy they've altered how combos get started, I'm actually for the way that combos now flow. Following a more simple juggle system of something like Tekken compared to most anime fighters which have tech outs. This might make for less positions where resets are available, and because of that it undoubtedly doesn't have as much player to player interaction. But I'm such a shut-in that even the thought of using people's poor tech out choices to benefit myself fills me with anxiety, so I'm in favour of this new change. The simpler combo system creates for an easier to access reward through launchers always being able to convert into at least passable damage, even if you never took the time to question your existence in training mode. The main thing that I would potentially identify as a problem is because of the cancel properties of most moves, combos don't have a lot of potential in variety, in mid-screen in particular. Some characters like Axel might have some extremely different combo routes in the corner, and I'm not against the fact that a large portion of the cast can simply loop their slash heavy special ender in the corner to make for effective combos. But the fact that in mid screen, lots of the characters only have slash heavy, maybe crouching heavy special as an option leaves me wanting a bit more from a lot of the cast. Obviously that doesn't apply to Soul, but I don't want to play Soul. What if I want to play... D Kai, I guess. I would imagine that there's a decent portion of people who don't mind the simplified combo route, which I can certainly respect and even see the benefits of. What I can't find justification for is how the damage numbers seem to be simulating the effects of making contact with a plane crash rather than a white girl and a pet house spawn. This certainly applies on a character to character basis, but the absurd amount of damage that characters like Soul and Ram get from the corner is inexcusable, and reasonable damage numbers from characters like Milia start to pin them down as weak. If you're going to have a system where combos in the corner are going to be stronger, that's perfectly fine and standard. But doubling the damage just because they're not centre stage isn't justifiable if you're going to have that lead to the player breaking the wall, gaining positive bonus, leaving me with 10% life and making the drywall look extremely submissive and punchable. High damage numbers are fine if they're earned, but even still, Sol doing DP with some meter doesn't mean that he should get paid twice as much as his brother just because his pecs are the size of a small house rather than a toppled over skyscraper. I understand that they wanted to keep the damage numbers high because it instills a sense of tension throughout the match as it makes a comeback from even the largest deficits, not as unlikely as it seems, but right now it doesn't create a sense of tension through a realistic chance that anyone can win. It does it by making some characters so explosive that it's like watching Russia and the USA throw nukes at each other during the Cold War, but they've both forgotten the alarm codes, and it's a race to see who can send their strongest smashes to decipher the alarm codes hidden in fighting game notation the fastest. If Arxis wanted to reduce the damage but still keep some of that tension, then they'd need to either increase the damage scaling during a combo, or create a threshold on hits that once passed impacts the combos very hard. You could also modify the way that Risk works, but I don't think that'd solve the core of the issue. Risk is this small purple bar at the top of the screen. You might not have noticed it, especially considering it's so small, but right now it's also a culprit as to why these damage numbers are so damn high. The way that it currently works is that as it builds up, it will make whatever attack lands next not begin to apply scaling. For smaller 3 hit combos, this is not a problem in the slightest. For a wall combo, your half HP combo will skyrocket to a 75% combo, because you're only going to start applying scaling after the 4th hit. 
I think. No matter how much I test it, I can't seem to get the exact way that it works. The main thing is, as the meter fills, no combo scaling starts to get applied. If this works the way that I'm going to assume, where no scaling gets applied to the combo if there's still some meter to spare, you'd be able to reduce the absurdly high explosive damage numbers by keeping the risk the way that it currently works, but by having the scaling kick in immediately based on the amount of hits that have already been applied. This way you'd still have the combos from risk still be impacted relative to non-risk combos, but you wouldn't create scenarios where people implode from the simplest openings. Regardless of where this damage comes from, either risk or particular characters, I'd be extremely surprised to see the damage stay in its current state. And personally, I think that the damage needs to be taken down by a massive amount, especially if you're going to have the corners be a fairly easy position to be in with such a small stage. Alright, now that I've done some complaining, let's finally be positive for a bit, because annoying the people that love the new title isn't enough for me, I'm also trying to intentionally annoy the people that hate it. I think that the new roaming cancel system is fantastic. It's got some odd quirks, but not only is it genuinely unique, but the complexity is also variable to the person that wants to use it. The new roaming cancel comes in four forms, three of which are actually cancels, and then there's yellow, which is just kind of sitting there, the festering failed abortion in the corner. A waste of space only to be enjoyed by people as unsuccessful as a person as yellow is a mechanic. You might be able to tell I'm not a fan of yellow. Yellow roman cancels are activated like the rest of them. Press P, K, and S at the same time and you'll pop. Or you can just press the macro. Yellow is what comes out when you do it on block and stops your opponent from pressing and allows you to regain your advantage in exchange for 50% of your bar. How much advantage? 10 frames. Personally, I don't think that this is nearly enough advantage, considering it can also be blocked and requires you to use 50% of your meter, which is the same as your combo extender, setup maker, and your... Uh, this one's a bit hard to define, we'll get onto you later. Realistically, if I'm going to spend 50% of my meter for a move that often doesn't leave me close enough to take advantage of them 10 frames, I would want something that's a bit more substantial, perhaps a knockdown like... Uh, them's fighting herds. As it stands though, I don't really see much use in it. And while I'm sure that some of the nerds out there will figure out how to make it useful, once you see just how little value you get from it, it almost always feels like you're doing the wrong choice. Thankfully, the other three aren't such disappointments to the family. Red, purple, and blue all serve different functions, but they all share that they have this circle that impacts your opponent, can all be drifted, where you can move in a set direction after it's been cast by dashing just beforehand, and can all have its wind-up time cancelled into a button with the correct timing. If you can't see how this might be useful, just look at the difference between an air dash and a fast RC cancel in the same direction. Wait, oh, hold on a second, that's the movement that I wanted from earlier, but now it costs bar, what the fuck? Red applies if you've just hit your opponent, both on block and on a normal connection, and launches the opponent with a set knockback if it hits. It's a super simple way of making combos extend, and while for the nerds this is a combo maker's wet dream, I think that it most strongly impacts the people who haven't given up on being accepted by society. The launch property combined with the juggle system means that even without an idea of what you want to do with the RRC, you're still able to make that 50% feel worthwhile through a combo that ends up doing at least possible damage. Purple RC happens during the whiff or recovery of a move, and now the circle applies a slowing effect. For the most part, it's used alongside the drifts in order to make for some pretty nasty mix-ups. The main thing to note here is that while I'm certainly not enough of a nerd to number crunch my way to a two-way mix-up, when PRC doesn't actually connect to get me an opening, it feels like a massive waste, even when I have found a setup that makes it an applicable option. Spending 50% of your meter to end up back on someone's block feels like a very largely wasted opportunity, when the same meter could have been used to extend your combos, both in damage and in length, as well as being used for supers. This means that you're almost never going to use it at a longer distance, since even if you do successfully get that ground that you were looking for, you spent what effectively amounts to somewhere between 50 and 80 damage to do so. Blue RC is a mechanic that I admittedly still haven't gotten my head around. The blue circle massively slows down your opponent so much that they might as well briefly turn elderly. The main purpose, from what my incompetence can gather, is that you can use it to punish whiffs that you normally wouldn't be able to, but personally I've not been able to find many applications for it. This mechanic might be one that people around my skill level, which is fairly middle of the road, don't employ but gets utilized more by the higher level players. I wouldn't know since I don't really watch tournaments and it's also really early days and so not every single player is using every single mechanic. Initially, I thought that this roaming cancel system was the best that it's ever been, and while I still haven't changed my mind in that idea and it's still the best mechanic Strive offers by a long shot, I think it's hard to compare it directly to the older roaming cancel system and call it better. When you combine the new roaming cancel 
experimental system with drifting and fast RC, I see so much potential. A lot of which I wouldn't really want to put the time into, but the many ways that you could utilize the system does make for one I have to give praise to. I might not want to put the time in to learn how to use fast RC drifts on block to open someone up, but No Life 69 can think about these different ideas both prior to a match and intuitively mid-match to really push more out of a system than a simple cancel system would be able to provide. I'm a large fan of when one option can cascade into many others, and while I think that that's something in a general that fighting games lack, I'm glad to see roaming cancels pack so much potential possibilities into one system that you can really fine tune it into how you want to play. So it's unfortunate that I think that the meter has a core problem of everything costing the same, so it feels very flat and lifeless. You might think that this is an editing error, but it's not. I want to emphasize to you that this is probably one of my largest problems with fighting games in a general. Hardly any of them do anything interesting with their meter. When games have super meters as complex as you can choose between level 1 and a level 3 super, I want to roll my eyes so hard that they fall out of my skull and spin like a ping pong ball towards the nearest hydraulic press. These super meters don't really become an interesting choice, it becomes a case of this combo or pressure situation did or did not involve a super. You use this meter very passively in your thought process which pries away any sense of satisfaction that I could get and becomes a non-option. I want to make it clear that this is not Strive's meter. I think that it's more complicated than that by a significant margin. Even without discussing how Faultless Defense is tied to the bar, the force choice between each of the Roman cancels and supers at least creates an interesting decision in what you're going to prioritize. Do you want damage or do you want a reversal option? Do you want something that might be able to help you open up a particularly stubborn turtle so long as you have the right setup? Do you like wasting your resource? This creates the scenario where you're actively engaging with the resources that you've been handed. And instead of wanting Wanting to bust out immediately might have to choose what's right for you. The thing is, because everything costs the same amount, you have no resource economy. Choices from one decision earlier might impact another, but only if you didn't succeed in the way that you had planned. With every option costing the same amount, you cannot cut yourself off from larger choices later because of smaller choices beforehand, or be forced to rely on less impactful resources in order to afford you the opportunity to gain more resources later. This makes this meter limited to right and wrong choices rather than a spectrum from good to bad. Faultless Defense, which is the push block that uses meter to activate, does occasionally create this type of weighing up the options that I think is missing, but only when you're right about to bust and you're getting edged between the 50% mark, since the option is only applicable to on-block situations and doesn't drain enough to be felt when you're, say, between 0 and 35%. This makes for a resource with choices, but the kind of choices that are comparable to the moral binary of Bioshock. Do you do the thing that's clearly in the right, or are you the wrong blight on human humanity that doesn't have the balls to kill children. Compare that to the resource systems that have more options tied to it with varied values, especially ones with meaningful low-cost options and impactful, powerful, high-cost options. Like for example... <sighs> Alright, I legitimately can't think of one outside of Guilty Gear. Ultra 4 does interesting things with its EX meter, but it squanders it with the Ultra meter and doesn't do anything with it defensively. If I remember correctly, Blazblue also does some interesting things with its resources, but I'm not willing to learn another madly complicated fighting game just for this video. A game like Plus R has different options that vary from 25-50% to 50 of your meter. You've got really strong supers, dead angles, and the one that makes the announcer use vocabulary the player base isn't familiar with at 50. And Force Roman cancels and EX moves at 25. Using EX moves might cut you off defensively since you no longer have access to your defensive choices at 50, but that same EX move might cover you now to never put you in a position where you actually have to end up saving meter by not putting yourself in that position to begin with. That 25% could also play into your advantage and get you to a point where you're now putting someone in Okizemi situations and giving you even more bar. At that point, faultless defense also becomes more impactful since you're going to have to weigh up whether being a piss baby who can't just block is really worth losing your FRC and progress towards a super or dead angle. This to me makes for a meter that I perceive as one with more opportunity to create variable sets of choices on a spectrum from good to bad rather than one that is right and wrong. And while I think you might be able to argue that YRC could potentially be an option, I legitimately don't think that any of these would be good for a rethink in its value. The problem is that combined with the drift system, all of these would be too strong to bring down their value. PRC might be a debatable contender, but then you'd have to get rid of the time stop, slow down, and drift. But then you might run into the problem of characters like Axel becoming a nightmare if you don't pin them down from round start, which is kind of already an issue. I'm sure that many people don't see this as a problem, but as 
as someone who'd rather see their meter as a currency rather than a timer that counts down to when I'm allowed to have fun, this bar leaves quite a lot to be desired from me. All of the options that are tied to it are great. I think they're unique, and while I wouldn't want the RC system to be something adopted by many other fighting games, the application here makes it one of the most enjoyable uses of meter in a game. I just wish that the meter that it was tied to was more interesting, especially defensively. Before I talk about the defensive systems, I should note that my defense isn't so much as poor, more in extreme poverty. I'm very bad at wrestling back control from the driving seat, maybe because I've developed a fear of using training mode to learn new things, maybe because I'm easy to read. And so it's obvious to me that I probably don't have the best understanding of the defensive game. So take this portion with a grain of salt the size of my ego when I say that while jump back is absurdly strong, faultless defense just blocking, and YRC are not strong enough at the moment, and make for defensive situations where I'm always going to be looking for my opportunity to jump back to escape whatever they throw at me, rather than using Faultless to create space, just block to sneak in openings, or YRCs to regain control of the situation. I think that Faultless defense is actually pretty good in isolation. The problem comes in that there's just so many advancing specials, or moves like Solfar S, that you're often not going to move your opponent any kind of significant distance to open up new opportunities for yourself. Faultless also increases the amount of hit stun that you're in by a massive two frames, and while this certainly doesn't change too much, it compounds on the problem of situations where push blocking is literally a waste of meter. I get that Faultless is supposed to be a mechanic that slowly provides advantage through distance rather than filing a restraining order against your opponent, but because the block strings aren't very long, it doesn't feel like you're making any difference to the situation whether or not you Faultless, as there aren't enough hits to even force a whiff if you Faultless every single hit. This was probably a concession that was made for instant Faultless defense, which is a just block whilst you're also in Faultless defense. A just block by itself makes it so that your character receives zero pushback on block, leaving your opponent close to you and giving you some meter. It requires an extremely precise timing of pressing back within two frames before the move connects. For reference, a third strike parry on the ground requires you to hold forward within a six frame window if I've done my research correctly. There seems to be a misconception that just blocks give you additional frame advantage as well, but from everything that I've been able to find, this isn't actually true. I personally can't find a proper use for just blocking, although I'm confident that this is just me lacking wanting to find a use for it more than anything. Apparently you can use it to punish moves like Mega Fist, but I mean, I don't really care, that's not really important to the point that I'm about to make. What I would like to use is instant faultless defense, which applies massive pushback to your opponent and also applies the additional frames of block stun. There's a catch though, you can't just do the already difficult just block input with faultless up. You have to do a just block and then return to neutral. This has some pretty huge problems, mainly being that if you want to do this during a block string, which would be the most ideal scenario, you're now going to have to risk a massive likelihood of missing the absurdly precise input and getting hit because you've just been forced to return to neutral in order to get the pushback that you were intending. Sometimes that pushback not even being enough to force your opponent away from the whiff that you were trying to force. There might be some balancing reasons for why it is this way. I wouldn't know because I don't play at the level where this becomes a factor for me, but that doesn't excuse the fact that this is extremely unintuitive. If someone says just block and faultless at the same time, you expect it to work as described, but a more accurate description would be just just block and faultless and also flip this coin, guess heads if you're wrong we kill your dog. And with a window so slim against an action that you have no control over, you're likely to never be able to implement it. In the 100 hours that I have been playing, I have seen zero instant faultless defenses. The stuff that you've just seen for me to illustrate my point is the first time I've ever seen this mechanic. I'm sure that some pro players have been using it, but most of us are not professional players. And more importantly, I don't care if the pros are using it, if 99% of the player base can't even make this mechanic appear. I understand that I'm English and so I use this word incorrectly a lot, but when literally nobody has used this mechanic in a hundred hours of playtime, even by fucking accident. I think that that should be good reason to sound the this mechanic doesn't fucking work alarm. And if faultless defense is not impactful for the reason that the instant variant exists, it needs to be given a disabled parking space to make it more accessible. 
I don't think that analogy works at all, but I'm assuming that you get the point that I'm going for. YRC has an entirely different problem that we've already discussed. It's extremely easy to access, but very infrequently a good choice to make is the sacrifice that you have to make for your meter isn't worth the outcome most of the time. As you might be able to tell, I think that the defensive systems are extremely weak at the moment. And because your choices are so limited on what can actually be effective, once you're responding to someone else's pressure, it feels like you're playing patty cake with your opponent rather than trying to find the right opportunity to sink them with a shield. Breaker. If the defense had more actual choices to make and not just responding to someone resetting pressure with up back, I think that it would make for a significantly more interesting game. This wouldn't even necessarily need to be by giving the defender more options, but by giving the oppressor more variety in how they can open someone up. But in order to do that, you'd likely have to reform and subsequently break the rest of the game as well. I think that in terms of universal mechanics, that's all I really have to say. Almost 20 minutes of it's not x hard later, so let's fast slash our way to the next disjoint piece of our pizza, yes that is the analogy we're still on if you forgot, characters. If you haven't already lost respect for me, I have good news. My choice in characters will send you into such an anger fueled frenzy you'll likely have a heart attack, see the pearly gates, and request that God set a plague of dolphins upon me in a bitter sense of irony. Yes, I'm a degenerate. I like anime fighters, this isn't really news. But aside from being fond of war crimes, I'm also a fan of things that are a little bit more respectable. Like this white phosphorus that definitely wasn't intended for civilians. Insensitivity disguised as humor aside, I've laid out all of the mechanics beforehand because I've seen quite a few people on the electric cesspit that we call the internet claim that the characters aren't unique between them and all feel the same, which is entirely wrong. What I think that those people are trying to get at is the lack of flexibility in the universal mechanics that makes them play very similar from person to person, not character to character. This makes them feel like they're designed to fill certain roles like you're playing a hero shooter rather than be a character to mould into your own like in a fighting game. I want to acknowledge that this isn't an inherently bad thing, and there are examples of fighting games out there that lean into the roles of characters quite well, but most of the time these games have a decent amount of the cast be flexible enough that they actually cover two or three roles. Strive however has an entire cast of characters that are built around one or two tools, and depending on what those tools are will dictate whether you have a character that is varied, interesting, and relative to the other characters is entirely overloaded, or a character that has jump back S and crouching heavy. It might come as a surprise to you that somehow I ended up liking the characters that are A, the character where the dolphins on screen so much that you could assume that Mei was the puppet, and B, the character that's definitely some form of phobic or ist seeing how much he doesn't want other people near him, but believe me, I tried and failed to like any of the other characters. Or at least, I failed to like playing as them, which I can't expect the game to accommodate for. Even though Dark Souls is one of my favourite games of all time, I'm not going to be having as good a time if you tell me to put away the weapon that screams I'd go to Japan and wonder where the subtitles are, and pick up a staff and start cosplaying as Gandalf, which isn't a flaw of the title. It's intentionally meant to be flexible and have a lot of options to make it so that everyone can find a way to play that they like, rather than making every option one that every player will want to go for. The key in a fighting game is that they can't just be fun for the person playing as them, but they also have have to be fun to play against. To some respect, I think that Strive fails its characters in this regard, but that's more because of a lack of universal systems, never allowing them to be characters with a lot of expression. You might have expression through whether someone likes to grab a lot, or how frequently they look for a frame trap, but many of the characters don't have interesting ways to do things with their toolset until they have some meter. It's a shame that we're all poor then, because we're not likely to gain enough meter to use the Roman cancel more than once, maybe twice at a stretch per match. A lot of characters in neutral don't have full screen options, with many of the mid screen options almost always leading to close quarters follow ups because nobody benefits from distance. Except for Axel and some other exceptions, I'm omitting the ones that are obvious to the people that have already played it for the sake of brevity, because despite how long we've been here I'm genuinely trying to keep this short. I certainly wouldn't want every character to have a long range option that's good, but the consistent lack of full screen choices makes even positional choices seem samey between players. Many matches between different people playing the same matchups will end up playing nearly identical identical because of this lack of opportunity for player expression. As a result, a lot of my time playing Strive at the moment feels like I'm fighting the character rather than the player, with the only major exceptions being in Celestial playing against some Fausts and Zatos who were so significantly better than me, all it did was remind me that the top rank is basically I've played some other fighting games before rank, where Jimmy Joe Silver and SF5 can get put up against literal TSM sponsored Swedish basketball player. That leaves me feeling impartial towards most of the characters, and leaves those that I 
I like playing against limited to the characters that can actually do a bit more outside of just wanting to be near you. A part of me likes playing against characters like Faust and Axel, characters who are actually doing things from full screen, and at least have the smallest amount of player expression by having tool sets that play into showing off how you choose to be a gigantic pussy, even if retreating jump S doesn't just need a nerf, it needs a public decapitation. Leo and Millie have forced me to make predictions rather than just wait a situation out when they're up close, which is pretty fun, but characters like Kai and Ram are just repeating the same cycle over and over again. Sol's frustrating to play against because he's a collection of all of the worst balance choices that you can make combined, but his tool set is actually quite fun to play, both with in practice and against in theory, because of just how much you can make him work for you. Obviously he's no fun to play against right now, because in his current state it's like trying to wrangle a rabid Godzilla to sit down nicely for the vet, but when his frame data and damage numbers have been toned down to almost reasonable levels, I'd imagine that for many people he'd be one of the most enjoyable matchups to be on the receiving end of. I don't think that it can be understated how annoying Mei is to play against. Not because she's extremely powerful, but because between these three moves you might as well have the game make all the choices for you, both up close and when bypassing any kind of neutral. And speaking of annoying to play against, even if it's not very good, this fucking guy. I know that the auto guard on Fujin isn't very good, but just because it's easy to deal with doesn't mean that it's engaging to play against. You're playing against Anjis that throw this shit out all the time, and it's a constant game of, no, stop, I know that that's why you're playing the character, but I'm bored of responding to your poor decision making. The rest of the cast, however, I think is reluctantly fine. I guess lackluster is a better word that I would use for it. I don't ever particularly look forward to playing against any of these characters, but again, this is due to the universal systems lacking any kind of player expression, making defense, neutral, and offense lackluster to both play and play against. I think that might be why I like Axel so much, and ended up drifting away from characters that I thought I might enjoy, like Milia and Giovanna, since they lean into parts of the game I dislike more. With a game that's not got a lot to work with creatively in the close range, it makes for a game where I'm having the most fun in neutral, and predicting what method of movement someone's going to approach with. Even when I'm not winning with Axel, I can start to enjoy it because it now becomes a game of fighting for my space again, or trying to trick you into thinking that I'm trying to flee. I never really want to engage with the offensive or defensive points of the game that I don't like, but now when I do and I'm forced to engage with it, it becomes an opportunity for player expression rather than the point that the whole game is built around. I'm unfortunately not exaggerating when I say that none of the other characters really did that for me, which might be why outside of Axel, I can only enjoy Strive when I'm winning. I like Mei because she's an easy win brain AFK character, not because she's a character that's particularly interesting in gameplay. Axel fits my style, so I can sometimes enjoy the game. I want to reinforce my point from earlier, that you're not going to enjoy every single character in the cast, but the fact that out of 16 characters, I enjoy one of them, sometimes, is a sign to me that I'm not enjoying the game because I like the game as a whole. I'm enjoying the game because this one option is allowing me to offset most of my problems with it, though allowing me to not have a bad time should not be confused with having a good time. Unsurprisingly, in the time that it took to write the script, speak it out, and then also get to this point in editing, I'm not having that great a time with Axel anymore, and as a result, I'm not really enjoying Strive. I can enjoy other titles outside of the characters that I can play well, because I think that the universal mechanics are engaging enough to give me that sense of satisfaction and expression. Finding one character that you gel with a lot should be an enhancement to the title that you already enjoy intrinsically, rather than the only reason that you are enjoying the title. As a side tangent, I think that games that are built specifically for close range engagements like Strive can be a good time, just look at Tekken. It's a bit of an oversimplification to say that Tekken is only played at the close range, but it's clearly designed around its close range gameplay. For that reason, it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but for the people that like that particular flavour of game, it's one of the best experiences that they can have. I might not like Sekiro, but for the people that like playing parry characters in Surge Likes, I can see why they might have held it high as one of the best. If Strive had pushed to create for a more intricate close-up game with more emphasis on those defensive mechanics to make the process of opening someone up not just a game of, you've now decided to press P, or maybe you're up backing, I could see myself enjoying a lot more of the cast. But with so many of the characters wanting to be in your face where the game gets the least interesting, I don't see much value in the characters, and as such, I can only enjoy very particular sections of the game.
Overall, I think that Strive's core gameplay loop leaves a lot to be desired, the main problem being that the movement naturally draws you into close quarters, but that close quarters gameplay lacks any immediate sense of choice, both defensively and offensively. Block strings are simple and small, so there's a lot of emphasis on resets, at which point the mind game becomes are they going to press to try and steal the advantage, jump to avoid the reset, or turtle up and do nothing. This is the core of most fighting games on block that allow you to jump and actually do something, and is certainly a good foundation to work with. But I'm not impressed by the groundwork of a game, I'm impressed by the house that was built on it, and while what's built right now functions just fine, nothing about it is particularly impressive. Especially since the sex basement that you built that is the Roman cancel feels closer to a sex crawl space with how little opportunity there is to access it. This leaves me looking for more interesting things happening in the neutral, but the air movement means that I never want to dodge and weave my way through a scenario, and most of the characters clearly aren't designed to be doing much at longer distances other than getting closer to each other. The spacing element of the mid-range can be kind of fun, but since it's all built to lead into a lackluster close quarters engagement, I find myself not wanting to experience it all like it's a terrible ending to an otherwise above average anime. The ending of a race literally ruined the rest of the show, it's awful. You might assume that with everything that I've said, I hate this game, and I certainly haven't fallen in love with it, but despite how much I have to critique here, I still think that it's a decently well-made game. It just feels like there's nothing unique enough happening to offset the bits of negativity that stand out really hard, which leaves me not want to come back for seconds after I've already shoveled 100 hours of a mediocre fighting game into my mouth. That's admittedly a massive amount of time, and the only reason that I spent 100 hours trying to gleam some entertainment from Strive instead of dropping it and playing older games in the franchise is that it's got hands down the best netcode in the genre. I can't believe it's taken this many years for a major title to catch up with smaller games like Skullgirls and every single game given third-party emulation networking through Fightcade, but Strive absolutely knocks it out of the park with its online play. Or at least, it certainly does once you're in the match. Everything else outside of the match feels like you're trying to navigate the rebel of Kvatch to find your setup. I reckon that now's as good a time as any to point out that the biggest thing holding this game back at the moment is the lobby system and the server communication times. I suspect that a lot of you have probably been shaking your head at everything that I've had to critique so far, but I'd hope that we both agree that even for the people that do like Strive, every moment outside of the core game is near tragic. Normally menu navigation wouldn't even be a point to discuss, so if you haven't played Strive, take some time to think about just how bad it has to be to get a whole section of the video dedicated to it. For the people skipping by in this video, Strive's netcode is fantastic. It's probably helped by an extremely high player base for a fighting game, but I have never played a title that runs smoother online. The fact that Rollback was a we might have this if we get around to it feature and it puts every other game on the market to shame almost justifies the asking price on its own. The connection to your opponent should be like good UI design. If it's done correctly, I should never even think about it. And outside of the first three days where I was shocked by just how much I could push a button and have it come out sometime within this century, I've nearly never looked at the ping. Compare that to Guilty Gear Exard, and no matter how much I love the title, I can't help but fixate on the shit-stained pants, shoes, and shirt that it's wearing with the frame delay. I strongly believe that any other title going forward without rollback in the future is going to struggle severely because of just how strong a showing Strive has put in. So it's a shame that it's tied to Habbo Hotel with less questionable activity and a main menu that takes so long to connect to you could assume that I was sending my packets via Carrier Pigeon. On the topic of the main menu, not only should it not take two full minutes to connect to your basic entry point to the features of the game, I've got a feeling it's only going to get worse as time goes on unless it's actively addressed. I say that because every single time that I want to revisit Dragon Ball Fighters, it seems to take longer and longer to connect to the lobbies online as well. If Arc System Works hasn't been able to fix this problem in an old title that seems to be extremely similar, if not identical, then I don't see this being fixed in this title unless people start specifically voicing concerns concern while the game still has developers on it. Knowing how game dev goes, it's likely that by the time this video is released, the amount of active developers has plummeted for the title already. But if they're putting out DLC, we still might have a shot at getting this resolved, if we make enough of an argument that this would significantly benefit the whole player base if they were to optimise this process. On the other hand, the lobbies in the rank system are a mess, but realistically, I think that there's been so much work put into it and so much of the game has been built around it that we're likely to not see this get significant improvements 
ever. I've seen quite a lot of people voice complaint about the visuals of the lobbies, and while I also took the same low-hanging fruit of a complaint only 285 words ago, that's far from the core of the problem. And some people don't like the way the Ultra Kill looks, so I don't think that anyone can be trusted to judge visuals in all honesty. The two actual problems are the dual stations themselves and the ranking system. The problem of the dual stations are mostly optimization, but also in part design. One of the problems is that, even inside of ranked lobbies, you can see your opponent's character beforehand and get a general idea of how much time they've put into them, but not probably the most vital piece of information that is how likely I am to see teleporting like Dalzim having a seizure because of Wi-Fi. I've heard the criticism that Wi-Fi indicators and ping being displayed before a match takes place leaves players with connections that aren't stable, locked outside of the game, and unable to play. And I certainly feel like this is a valid problem. But I shouldn't have to leave my gameplay experience up to chance, and not letting me know what peer-to-peer -peer connection I'm about to be playing in is like playing a game of League of Legends, but the server I'm going to be connected to is randomized. Being able to see someone else's character can also have another problem, in that people can just avoid playing against specific characters. I'm certainly not against that in an unranked match, but in a competitive environment, it makes for a ladder system that's easy to manipulate by intentionally playing matchups that put you in an advantage. That's if you can even get into a match. Failed to obtain dual station information is a message that will be burned into your retina if you play this game for any significant amount of time. The message is some kind of server error for these specific ports, and simply does not connect you and you have to walk over and find a new station for what seems to be no reason. The worst part is that somebody can be on a setup, but nobody can connect to them on the other side because the other person is getting a dual station information error. So they stand there waiting for people to connect, but nobody ever does. Does. A lot of your time playing, whether that be a ranked or a normal match, will be running around trying to find a station that you're able to connect to, and then waiting for someone else to also stop questioning if they're suffering exponential packet loss to get on the other side, and occasionally not even being able to do that. I legitimately think that this will end up hurting the longevity of the title, because even for a lot of us who are intending to go into the game and play it for more than two to three weeks, the technical problems make the title hard to engage with for longer periods of time. It didn't keep me back enough to stop me from reaching the top rank, in any other game I'd probably consider this quite an achievement, but in Strive it feels more like an inevitability of time rather than a display of skill. Strive is a unique little butterfly that doesn't have a traditional rank system, where your skill is displayed with a numerical value, instead you go from floor to floor without any point system, or at least without a point system that's shown to you as a player. Each floor dictates a new rank, 10 standard floors, and a not so hidden 11th floor called Celestial. Parts of this system are excellent, even though the dual station seem indecisive about letting you connect to them, the floors do a good job of keeping players at higher skill levels from beating up the new players like college students put into a boxing ring with preschoolers. Not by disallowing those matches to happen, but by making the children have to request it. Players at a higher rank can't access the floors of those below them, but players at a lower rank can access the ones above them, with the exception of Celestial which is locked away until you rank up past the 10th floor. This allows the players that really want to challenge themselves to do so, but also leaves leaves the players at the higher end of the skill ceiling to be able to not have to deal with the admittedly pretty boring task of beating up players that are significantly below their skill level. Celestial is also unique in that while you can't go down between normal floors, Celestial players can go down and play in floor 10 lobbies. At first this might seem like an extremely dumb thing to do, but when you consider that many people will get to Celestial with their main, and then want to learn another character without having to be put up against players that are now much better than them because they're learning a new character, I think that this was the right choice as it allows them to breathe a little and learn new characters in an environment that isn't overwhelming. But the system is still unfortunately pretty flawed. Note how earlier I said Celestial was for the higher end of the skill ceiling rather than the highest. Celestial is just way too easy to get into, and I think that's proven by the fact that I managed to get into Celestial twice. And while I'd say that I'm at least competent at fighting games, I'm extremely far from the top end of the player base. This makes Celestial a fine environment for me to play in, however if you're a top player, which this section is designed for, you're going to find that the floor has a massive skill group of players in it, ranging from your local friend that can't make it out of the qualifying stage of tournaments, to Justin Wong and the guy that parried Justin Wong so hard that he made for one of the only times that fighting games have been culturally relevant esports wise. I want to say that this is more a problem of Strive selling better than expected. They probably made a rank system to accommodate the amount of people that would stick around after the first week, but now 
now two months later they're still here and there aren't enough ranks to keep everyone preoccupied. Either way, that doesn't excuse the fact that ranking up and down is downright archaic since there's no communication as to how close or far you are to ranking up. Aside from a brief message that sometimes appears in the pre-match that I can't show you because I'm now Celestial, but also because the rank matches in Strive are three. Best of three or first to three? No, just three. Regardless of win or loss count, Strive kicks you out of your ranked matches with your opponent after the third game. A game limit is important. It makes it harder for people to grind against one particular person for points like you can inside of titles without that limit like Tekken 7. Strive doesn't do anything else to try and stop that, but that's not the point here. The problem is that you're just playing three games as opposed to matches towards a goal like a first two or a best of three. In situations where game one goes to one player and the next two go to another or three games games go to just one player, this is fine. When a player wins the first two games and then loses the last, it feels like someone is being forced to declare a loss in an MMA fight, but is also reluctantly forced to kick the winner in the balls as you both leave. That is to say, it feels like a competitive cliffhanger that leaves neither player satisfied as you don't have the games to see if your opponent has adapted and you can't figure out what they've changed or if they just got lucky. All of these combined leave the rank system feeling like it's tacked onto the system but with negative thought put into it. A shame all in all, considering that it's probably the way that most people are going to be accessing the game for the most part, because God knows that there isn't anything worthwhile in the single player. And would you look at that, if it isn't our old friend the I clearly don't like fighting games as a genre, I just like good video games star. This is a problem that the whole genre suffers from. I can't believe that games still get away with glorifying 8 bot matches in a row, calling it arcade mode, and then have people willing to turn around and defend it like these are worthwhile inclusions to the title. Maybe that's me being bitter, bot matches can be quite valuable to players that don't have the internet available to them that allows them to play online. So I wouldn't want arcade mode gone and I wouldn't deem it reductive to the product by any means. I just think that if this was any other genre where matches were under 20 minutes, we'd look at the arcade mode as the main source of offline gameplay and go, this isn't just filler, it's bad filler. At least the arcade mode in Strive does try a little bit harder than most. The final segment of each character's arcade run introduces a modifier to the match that makes the battle feel unique. And since it comes right at the end and is supposed to be a surprise, I guess I'll put a spoiler warning here for the people that care about it. Yes, it is an hour into the the video fuck off. The modifier is a double battle. You and an AI controlled partner take on a high HP mobile version of Nagori Yuki. At first I was quite charmed by this. It was quite novel to see a game that doesn't really seem too keen on being considered bullshit throw it out the window for a power trip final level. And had it remained a novelty I probably would have liked it quite a lot. But as I went through each of the characters and found out that all of them were two on ones against the same character, even if you're playing as him, I was left a little bit disappointed, especially since I'd been forced to turn my brain off for the last eight minutes to get there. I just found out, however, that if you win every single round of every single match that comes beforehand, you won't be treated to a double battle, instead you will be treated to quite literally the worst boss fight that I have ever engaged with. Here's my live reaction to that. Oh my god! Why? Are you fucking serious? Why is that not here, Paul? Also, have you noticed that whilst he's in Blood Rage, he gains meter? That's fun. Why does he have so much fucking HP if you're gonna make it a single battle? It's so fucking boring. I knew that they cannot. You're telling me this fucking more, are you fucking serious? I'm going to assume that this was pretty low on Arc System's priority list, however. Considering just a year after the announcement for the game dropped, everyone was forced to work from home, I don't think it's too fair to point out that it's lackluster when I'm sure that everyone on the team also knows that, but had to spend the last year adjusting to working from home. And if the Asian game industry is anything like the English one, the pandemic left most of their staff's motivation converted from working on games to collecting the most sturdy ropes and the least sturdy chairs. I'm sure that they would have had more done with it had they been given the normal working conditions. I guess it's just a bit unfortunate that what's there doesn't have a lot going on. There's also survival mode, where you go on an endless set of matches against bots, but if there was very little life in the arcade mode, survival must be a future vision of the heat death of the universe. It's literally bot matches at an endless spree, with nothing interesting that occurs. Trying to gleam anything from this mode is almost impossible. The arcade mode is basically plain white bread with some butter. Giving me more bread and taking away the butter isn't going to to make me enjoy it anymore. I guess the only other thing that I should mention is the story, which 
Uh, Alright, I'm gonna be totally honest here. I started with this for an hour and I just gave up. The story is paced somewhere between a crawl and roadkill. And while that might be fine for some, it's personally a slowness that I've never been able to deal with. Especially considering it feels like an exposition dump inside of a universe that is also in itself an exposition dump. So instead I watched it on YouTube at double speed in English and came to the conclusion that it's so far away from my sphere of interest, trying to critique it would only end up in disgruntled boredom. I mean, more than there already is. This is not the part of Guilty Gear that's made for me. Instead, it's the music, gameplay, and the visuals. So in order to not do anything that might end up hurting my reputation even more, I'll just bury my head in the sand and go, I'm sure someone out there likes it. But speaking of hurting my reputation, do you remember when I said I don't think anyone should be allowed to judge the game graphically? Let's prove myself correct with the contradiction. If anyone's afraid that I'm going to say that Strive looks bad, I'd like to remind you that the baseball bat from earlier was made from what keeps me dense, not what keeps me on the waiting list for a lobotomy. The game looks like potentially the best thing you'll ever see if you're into the anime aesthetic, but it's not so aggressively Japanese that it makes you embarrassed to have it within your sightlines, search history, and sexual fetishes. I think that the UI looks extremely bland, but I can at least justify that it makes for more space for the characters and stages to shine. And if you think that there's any more stage deserving of praise than Axel's, you're still statistically wrong. There's so much life going on in this stage with so many moving parts and vibrant colours that it makes any other stage lack any identity by comparison. But that by no means should imply that they are poor, more that Axel's is just such a massive highlight. That doesn't mean that there aren't some minor annoyances going on, my main one being how risk is displayed so small that you can't tell how much of it has been built up without directly looking for it. This becomes a large problem when your eyes are darting around the screen towards the end of a life trying to take in all of the information around you and see whether a risky escape from the corner is worth it. The combo counter looks like it's got the personality of plain rice uncooked in a clear bowl, so frustrating that it was to me that I felt the need to make a whole video about it, and then unlist it because I realised how small a problem it was for something that ironically was so fucking large. The big issue is when the game wants to emphasise a counter hit, not because emphasising a major gameplay element that a lot of players don't understand is a bad thing, but because it does so by slowing down the whole game. I've had quite a few situations that I wasn't expecting a counter hit and so I end up pressing to produce a string. But nothing comes out because the slowdown is so dramatic that it messes up the timing to the point where my combos become less effective because the game basically paused midway through the match to explain the implications of a counter hit. I think that the game without the slowdown has a fine attempt of alerting the player to the scenario, mostly by drawing in the camera close and writing the words counter along the screen. And if this was the only aesthetic choice made, I'd actually be massively in favour as a good way to inform the player. But the slowdown causes the player to lose any sense of rhythm, making it feel as though you're fighting against the game. I'll be totally honest, I've gotten used to it now, and I think that there's an extremely strong argument that you could make towards the pause being a good thing, but I'd be lying if I said this wasn't a learned comfort, and for the first 60 hours it really messed with my flow and derailed my plans like it was a discussion around aesthetics right at the end of my mechanically driven review. Oh well, at least the BGM claps, and if you think that Disaster of Passion isn't the best song, you're literally wrong. All you need for everything I've got to say, I don't want people to leave this video thinking that I hate Strive. I know that it looks that way and I'm standing over the corpse of the game that I just tore to shreds, but I promise you that the knife that I'm holding was used to kill Granblue. I just don't think that I've ever put so much time into something trying to like it only to be returned with a middling feeling of, it's fine, with a sprinkling of, I'm incredibly bored on top. This game does have very strong positive elements, and not only the obvious ones like how drop dead gorgeous it is. The Roman cancel system is such a simple idea with incredibly interesting ramifications on how it could affect the game. You've got a nice blend of characters from extremely simple to decently complicated, and the netcode means that in 4 years time when the player base is only a fraction of its current height you'll still be able to find an acceptable match anywhere in the world. But none of that outweighs that so much of the game feels restrictive, to the meter, the cancel system, and the movement, it really feels like you're constantly having the fun slapped out of your hands anytime it starts to get really interesting. Strive finds a middle ground of trying to appeal to everyone without doing anything particularly spectacular. I understand that video games are products and not children to be cradled unlike some FGC members that throw a tantrum anytime you even look at a game that they like, but I'd rather something be out there and polarizing in its quality rather than play it safe and be unimpressionable. For some people I'm sure that this is fine, not every single title has to be a 10 out of 10, 
but when the asking price rivals the tax that Jeff Bezos hasn't paid and the season pass costs the GDP of Somalia, you really have to pull out all of the stops and make something fantastic. So Strive doesn't tickle my cock and suck me dry like I wanted, so I should in theory be looking for it to change. But seeing as how many people are enjoying it, I don't necessarily think that the game would benefit from seeing the dramatic changes that I'd want to make it more enjoyable. This makes me feel like a bit of a hypocrite, the way that you're staring at me contradict myself in the closing minutes, but also fuck you. Clearly there's something in the general game flow that appeals to people, and while I understand it the same way that I understand Mandarin, much like your typical English tourist in Asia, it starts to get unfair to request changes just to accommodate me. And even with a lack of understanding, it's not going to stop me from popping in whenever there's new DLC, but I was really looking for a new game to light the fighting game fire under my ass the way that the previous game in the franchise did, not make me feel the same way that I do about Skullgirls and pick it up and drop it without care. At the very least, I can tell that people are enjoying this as an introduction to a genre that's often convoluted and hard to understand, so perhaps the real gift of Strive is a new generation of fighting game players. It's fucking not, I didn't spend £55 on, ooh, somebody else likes it, but at least that's some kind of 6 out of 10 takeaway. I know that I'm so irked by this game because my heights were set so high and it didn't deliver, but once I cool off and take apart what's already there, I still see a title that's nearly entirely run of the mill in some nice packaging that feels bad to work with. I don't see why everyone's showering it in praise, but it also didn't leave a strong enough impression on me to find a reason to care. And so much like the rest of Strive, that's... fine. Oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Holy shit, she actually looks so cool!